Good afternoon, everyone. I have the wonderful time slot of being in the afternoon after you've all had lunch. Um, so I hope everybody can stay with me for a while. Um, I'm actually not going to talk about ArcGIS, so I'm going to shake it up a little bit. And so I hope you can bear with me. And I'm going to talk about um, climate positive design. I am a principal and landscape architect at CMG Landscape Architecture. And this is the wonderful crew, about 40 people that I get to work with every day, architects, um, landscape architects, and urban designers. And our mission is to increase the social and ecological well-being through artful design. And what that means is that we believe in bringing people and connecting them with their places, believe in connecting people together, and believe in the value of connecting people to nature. Uh, we've been located in San Francisco for about 20 years now. Most of our work is in that area from, and from small-scale tactile interventions all the way up to developing large models of resilience. Some of the work includes um, these sort of tactile, small-scale interventions such as the Crack Garden, um, working with local artists to create social activation by using um, the hoods of cars and a community band shell. And we work a lot in this kind of the mid-scale, where we're connect working with people and connecting public-private partnerships. Um, this example actually was of, it used to be a road, and it's been converted into an artful public park. We also have some public or pri private clients as well. So we worked with Facebook on their 10-acre green roof in the South Bay, and it was the primary goals of creating habitat and connecting the employees with nature up on the roof. So a lot of my work over the last several years has been really focused on um, climate adaptation. So sea, so sea level rise adaptation in the Bay Area, we're surrounded by water. Treasure Island um, is the model project that set the sea level rise adaptation guidelines um, in the region. And then most recently, I've been working on the, with the Port of San Francisco on um, protecting the seven and a half miles of waterfront um, from sea level rise adaptation and imminent um, threat of earthquake. But, those are really about us responding to the effects of climate change, so the, the impacts. And so over the last several years, I've asked myself as a landscape architect, as an urban designer, as a planner, I understand systems, I understand the complexities. Is there anything that we can do that actually starts tackling the causes of climate change? The greenhouse gas concentrations that are in the atmosphere, which are causing temperatures to rise. And we know that the urban built environment is responsible for about 75% of global greenhouse gas emissions that are causing temperatures to increase, decrease in air quality, increase in fire, increase in sea level rise. We've been hearing about this a lot today. But, you know, actually out of that, 36% of the built environment um, is contributing to those emissions that's actually outside of the buildings. And frankly, we've been asking ourselves the question, can we reduce those? Can we sequester more carbon? How are we going to measure those? And our emissions from outside the building come from the materials, so the embodied carbon that it takes to transport and manufacture those materials, the operational carbon emissions that come from fertilizers and maintaining landscapes over time. And then what's really unique about us is that we can sequester carbon, take carbon from the, out of the atmosphere, lock it up in the trees and plants, and store it in the soil. So we can be part of the solution. But why haven't we really been talking about this? And more importantly, why does it matter? Again, it's going to impact people's lives. And unfortunately, probably the people that have the least are going to be affected the most. Um, why I care about it is because this is me. I'm a little girl growing up on a farm in Missouri. It embedded this sort of deep sense of environmental stewardship um, that, that I can't shake, frankly. And it's what made me want to be a landscape architect and get involved in some of these issues that we're facing right now. But frankly, we haven't had the tools, the resources, or guidance in place for us to make that contribution. So fortunately, I was um, awarded with a, a fellowship through Landscape Architecture Foundation a couple years ago and started to dive down deep into kind of the heart of the matter. Frankly, we really didn't even understand our impacts from the very basics of what it means to have a landscape carbon footprint. So understanding the embodied carbon that comes from the materials that we're using, uh, how much carbon we can sequester from the sinks, the trees and plants in our landscapes, and then also those emissions that we are emitting over time. Well, there's so many things that you can do when you look at this very simply and ways to reduce carbon footprints. Um, we all know, looking at maps, that we can increase bicycle infrastructure, we can increase and make our cities more walkable. 
Um, we can keep carbon in the soil by using biochar, use reclaimed materials, minimize soil disturbance, use cement substitutions. Lots of good stuff that we've been talking about. And then also, from the increasing carbon sequestration standpoint, whether it's in the built environment from things like green roofs or using shrubs instead of lawn, super sequester plant material like bamboo, or really just protecting and conserving our natural resources like the forests, wetlands, seagrasses, and mangroves, or actually helping to restore those. So, as many landscape architects and many designers, I see a few in the room, we all think we're very sustainably minded. Um, why would we need to measure what we're doing? It's all green, right? It's great. But the reality is when you start to measure this, even from the very basics, just simple spreadsheets, what we found in some of our projects in our office is that we were emitting, this is a simple waterfront park project, looks pretty green. Um, the no amount of carbon that we're emitting is the red number in the corner, so about 400 metric tons of CO2 emitted from this couple acre park project. And the amount that we were sequestering is in green. And what it tells us actually is that we would take us about 15 years to offset the carbon footprint of this project. I just think it was a little bit surprising for us. We really didn't even think about our carbon footprint. But then when we start to put the numbers in front of us and understand what's really causing those emissions, where we're getting the most bang for our buck in terms of sequestration, we can add more trees. We can use materials that have lower embodied carbon. We can use more woody plants instead of lawn. Lawn's an actual emitter over time because of the fertilizers and the ongoing gas-powered equipment commonly. And so when we start to add all those things up, we realize we didn't really change the design of the park. Um, quality is still good, but instead it took us five years to offset that carbon footprint, and we had significantly less amount of carbon emitted and a much greater amount of carbon sequestered. So this pattern continues again and again through case study after case study, as we realize this is a half-acre plaza project. Um, it's pretty typical, you know, it has a program for um, people to have farmer's markets, all that good stuff, so there's a lot more paving here. It was gonna take us 200 years to offset the carbon footprint of that project for just a half acre. It was pretty shocking, I feel kind of embarrassed, frankly. <laughs> it's built, I can't go back, but I can change the way we go forward. And so again, looking at these with simple changes that we could have done, adding a handful of trees, using some materials with lower embodied carbon, cement substitutions, list kind of goes on, it becomes repeated but we could have offset that instead of 200 years, 20 years. So my point is, there's some opportunity here. But again, being able to make these changes comes from self-awareness. Um, we're different than an architecture field, so we um, actually have a lot more of our emissions come from the materials that we're using in our projects, since there's less effort that goes into the site work. Um, so useful information to keep in mind. And then to start understanding what is our business as usual. We don't have baselines to work with here. <laughs> so we're starting to understand through case study analysis, if we were to set, um, you know, looking at those case studies and we sort of project those out over time, we'd probably see as our 75,000 landscape architects in the world and the work that we're doing, we would likely emitting more carbon than we're sequestering. Um, over the next 30 years, that can be upwards of 200 million metric tons. But if we were to make those small changes in those case studies, what we would find is actually we could sequester more carbon than we emit by the year 2030, and by the year 2050, we could take a gigaton of CO2 out of the atmosphere. Again, these are with small changes that could be easily done, but it's with a consciousness and awareness that we now have by looking at this data. <clears throat> and to understand just a gigaton, probably that doesn't mean anything to many of you, but a gigaton, if you were to imagine it, is about the size of San Francisco, so seven miles by seven miles by about a mile high. And a gigaton would put just these projects in the top 80 solutions in Drawdown. If you've heard of it, it's from Paul Hawken. And when you take those solutions and combine them over an annual basis, what we would see is annual greenhouse gas emissions would begin to decline and thus reversing global warming. So that's what we're after here. I know we're not gonna save the planet, but I think there's a lot that we could do to make it what we're doing better. So um, this past year, I launched Climate Positive Design uh, with the goal of improving the carbon impact of the built environment through collective action. And what I'm looking at here is the, the idea that we all need to step up if we can and become leaders in this space. Um, I was at a conference and someone said, if you wanna take climate action, you will need to ask yourself two things. One, what action needs to happen, and two, what am I good at? So clearly we're starting to identify some things that we're good at here in this room. Um, by providing tools, guidance, and resources, we can sort of empower each other to step up and make changes. 
but we need to collaborate together so our impacts can be greater. And we start to educate our, ourselves and um, those around us. So I've been pulling together basically everybody I know over the last few years to get involved with this. Um, it includes my boss, it includes my firm, it includes my husband. My college roommate is up there and um, pulling together people and honestly, people that I've just met at conferences that is interested in getting involved and, sorry, I'm standing your way. It's a bunch of people <laughs> that I've wrangled into this, um, including a bunch of advisory partners from various organizations. Um, I'm not a tech person myself and so I've reached out to others that are really good at this <laughs> to help me um, and kind of making this platform. There are about six organizations that are sort of advisory partners, so they're providing guidance along the way and feedback um, as this is kind of in its infancy stages and we need um, guidance to go through this process. So with the launch came the Climate Positive Design Challenge um, that I've launched. So the goal is for our collective global projects to sequester more carbon than they emit by the year 2030 and then with the goal of taking a gigaton of CO2 out of the atmosphere by the year 2050. So it's establishing targets for projects in years to offset. So um, more rigorous targets for greener places like parks, gardens, um, mixed use projects, and uh, 20 years for projects that are um, inherently more urban and have more paving. So for people to meet the goals of the challenge, they use um, the web-based app called the Pathfinder. Um, it guides designers to reduce carbon footprints and increase carbon sequestration. Um, the data that's built into the database comes from the Athena Impact Estimator, that's where the embodied carbon values come from, and the Forest Service for sequestration data. And I've brought an outside environmental consultant to help um, verify that this aligns with industry standards. So, to one thing I did when I was working with um, in the fellowship is I asked my cohorts, um, what would it take you to take action or to change what you're doing right now? And they said three things. I said, one, it would have to be easy. Two, it would have to work into my workflow pretty easily. And then three, I would have to receive feedback to know that what I'm doing is gonna make a difference. And so maybe I'm putting back that back to all of you is that how maybe you can take away some lessons learned that I've had is that um, implying those, employing those in this tool. So the Pathfinder, there's some educational onboarding um, from the beginning that just kind of tells people what it means to be climate positive. We want to take more CO2 out of the atmosphere than we're emitting. You can do basic, enter some basic parameters into your site and get an initial score. Um, but there's a project database, so everybody that goes in sets up their own database full of projects. Um, they can go in and add projects or edit them at any point in time. Um, and, but of course we know there's a lot more detail that goes into our projects, so there's a place that you add more detail. But to the easy part, um, it's got to be quick and easy for people to use this. So really, if you have your quantities, you can plug them in probably in about five minutes. And to do like an overall assessment can take about half an hour if you sort of know what you're looking for. Um, but basically the users provide quantities, so just the basic numbers of area takeoffs that we have for any project that we're working on. Um, and as well as so for materials, for plants, and for maintenance plans. And the app provides instant, car instant feedback. So whether it's CO2 emitted from selecting 100 square feet of paving, or whether it's how much carbon you're going to sequester by entering your 100 trees, and that's regionally specific data. Um, that's about the sequestration. Uh, the app provides uh, pretty instant scorecard and design recommendations, and so that data can then be taken and plugged into life cycle assessments. So we need to get outside of our silo and work with other disciplines. Um, that's something that architects have been doing for years now and engineers, and so it's finally an opportunity for us to take that data collectively and um, contribute to larger site scale planning. And the app provides um, project-specific guidance and alternatives for you to learn how to reduce your carbon footprint and increase carbon sequestration. So what this does is, um, I think Ryan said at the beginning, I want to get your quote, was that um, data will change the future of development. And I think that's really um, what this is all about for the first time, collecting this data. Um, this is a call to measure uh, in a way that um, we think that it's actually going to start influencing. It is already changing how we're going to design, how we practice, how we advocate, change policies, set standards, and then ultimately educate and communicate with other people. 
So within the first 45 days of the launch, um, and I had no expectations for this, there was about 80 countries in the world that were reached and, and used the resources on the app, um, logged over 330 projects, and those projects um, planned the planting about 130,000 trees, which would be about the equivalent of taking 500,000 cars off the road in 30 years. So um, I know that's a lot more than that right now, but it takes a while to process all the data. So, um, and I think the question about like, what's, what's next? Where do you go from here once you start measuring these? Um, this is what the walls of my office look like right now. Um, we're thinking that this, we need to go beyond just making minor changes to our projects, that what, where we're up against right now requires radical transformation of our cities. And so we are thinking about um, how we can you know, work innovatively with new materials that have lower embodied carbon, like wood, for example. We are incorporating microforests into our projects and meadows, which we know are great carbon sequesters. Um, like Jack, <laughs> I guess he did this before us, <laughs> we're looking, we're working with what we have. So if it's on a site where we have a whole bunch of boulders, we're making them part of the design opportunity. We're incorporating on-site nurseries into our projects and setting up stewardship days for our clients to go out there and get their hands dirty with us so they can actually start to appreciate the value of the land and what they're creating. Um, the places that we've already thought about, we're really maximizing the carbon sequestration potential, um, scaling up some ideas we had 20 years ago about just depaving things and just making sure that we're making the most of the beauty that's already there that we're designing. And then lastly, I want to leave you with just something that's actually been bothering me. Um, but I, I don't know if all, you're all familiar with it, this One Trillion Trees initiative that started. Actually, a pretty amazing research that came out of um, some Swiss lab. But um, it's fantastic. They realized that we can plant a trillion trees around the world, and they've, ma they've uh, mapped out how much carbon we can sequester. But I, I didn't realize when I read it six months ago what it bothered me about it was the fact that it excluded uh, agricultural and urban areas, and, and which you know seems reasonable. They want to kind of maximize the amount of area we can plant trees. But what bothered me about it is they said that we're excluding the urban areas because we need room for people. And honestly, it took me a while to understand why that bothered me. But then I realized because because when I look around, much of the city looks like this, and I don't think it's good for people, and it's not good for the environment. And to me, I think it should look like this, and that we need to start demanding radical transformation for cities, so that they are better for people and they are better for the environment. Plazas are the same. I mean, there's open spaces that are full of paving, no people, no trees, and I think it's a great opportunity that we should start thinking about things differently. So, lastly. Just based on that, um, the World Bank tells us that most of the population lives in a very tiny area on the Earth, actually about the size of Massachusetts. And the US Forest Service and American Forest tells us that we are woefully low on our urban canopy for trees. And that with that increase over the next coming years, we should easily be able to get 150 million trees within those urban areas just to get us to the basic um, canopy that the American Forest and US Forest Service recommends. So if you start to look at that and how much carbon we sequester, it's you know, even beyond what we thought we could do with projects. And then if we were just to add 20 trees per acre beyond that, again, you could double that amount of carbon sequestration. So I think the challenge is out there for all of us to be maybe pushing the boundaries, thinking a little bit differently and about how we can take action in what we do every day. So, um, Anyway, anyone that's interested in contributing, um, you can go online and incorporate this into your work, blog your projects, I'm looking to collaborate with people in other disciplines that are interested in taking action as well. Um, there's a suggestion box on the website uh, where you can make comments. Also, this is um, voluntary and with no funding, so if anybody wants to donate on the GoFundMe page or send research grant opportunities uh, or just even help spread the message, um, be really appreciated because I think why it matters is because we're all in this together. Thank you.